This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Almost exactly three years ago, I made my first video about Starship. It was focused on artificial gravity, and for whatever reason, it got a ton of attention. Now, every time Starship makes headlines, it resurfaces. So of course, with the recent success of the fourth test flight, it's been getting some renewed attention, and I've had multiple people tell me that my reference to Artemis has aged like milk. This confuses me, because when I was discussing Artemis, I simply mentioned that SpaceX had just been chosen as the sole provider for the early Artemis lunar lander, and that the $2.89 billion in funding would definitely speed up development. But for whatever reason, it didn't speed up development enough for these commenters. So that begs the question, how fast is fast when you're building the world's biggest rocket? Let's rewind to May of 2021 when I made that video and take a look at the state of Starbase. SpaceX did have a few large buildings, but much of the work was still being done in tents. The pieces that would become the iconic Starship launch tower were scattered all around Starbase, and the pad was still very much a work in progress. They had done hops of sketchy prototypes, slightly less sketchy prototypes, and had almost landed a still sketchy Starship SN10 just for it to explode a few minutes later due to a hard landing. I used a clip of that SN10 explosion in my video, not just because it was a spectacular failure that reinforced my point about Starship still being a very early prototype, but it was also the best attempt we had seen up to that point at a belly flop landing. Somewhat intentionally, it was only two days after I published my video that SN15 completed its 10 kilometer flight. It successfully landed, making it the first, and until very recently, only prototype to survive a belly flop landing. Also, this is all the second stage. The first stage had only had one prototype at the time, which had already been decommissioned and scrapped. There were parts scattered around for the next prototype, Booster 3, but parts for the first booster to actually fly, Booster 7, wouldn't be spotted until October of 2021. The contrast between 2021 and 2024 is remarkable. SpaceX has gone from these failed 10 kilometer belly flops to two successful orbital ascents and a toasty but successful belly flop landing all the way from orbit. Now somebody's gonna point out that it wasn't technically orbit, which is true, but that's intentional and it's so close to orbit, it pretty much doesn't matter. But more importantly, the entire Starbase facility has been transformed into a full-fledged factory, producing higher quality components at an accelerated rate. Sure, they haven't sent people around the moon yet, and they didn't make the arbitrary 2024 moon landing date that came with the announcement of Artemis, but no one in the industry really expected them to. And for what it's worth, no one else is ready either. From SLS to the spacesuits, the whole program has always been tracking a much later date for the mission. So to me, the idea that since they were awarded the Artemis contract, Starship development hasn't been fast makes no sense. But let's take a step back and try to put this all in perspective. The Saturn V is the obvious comparison to Starship. Both are record holders for the world's biggest rocket, and both were funded for an ambitious lunar landing mission. If you Google how long it took to develop the Saturn V, you'll see that it was about five years. If we compare that to Starhopper, the first Starship prototype, that started construction in 2018, and then Starship hit orbit for the first time in 2024, so that's six years. I guess that means that Starship loses, case closed. Well, not quite. First, let's look at the Saturn V. The first prototype was the dynamic test vehicle, SA-500D, which you can still see in person at the Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. This initial prototype was built in 1964, only three years before the first flight of the Saturn V. But let's compare that dynamic test vehicle to Starhopper. The Saturn V prototype looks exactly like a Saturn V. Starhopper looks nothing like Starship. Like, sure, it's shiny and mostly a cylinder, but that's about it. That's why nobody counts the dynamic test vehicle as the start of Saturn V development. With the design philosophy of NASA, they had already done a ton of the engineering work by the time they built any hardware. SpaceX took a different approach, building and testing while the design was still rough and flexible, and allowing their findings to drive their decisions. The five-year mark is when NASA announced that they would be building the Saturn V, or at the time, the Saturn C5, and that's where the engineering really got started. That seems like a fair enough starting point, except for one thing. The third stage of the Saturn V 
was already in development. The Saturn V third stage is the S4B. That comes from the Saturn 1B, which was an iteration of the Saturn 1 and its second stage, the S4. That started work all the way back in 1958, nine years before the Saturn V flew. Now, it's not fair to add all of that time because the Saturn 1 was its own rocket and it flew and was operational before the Saturn V, but that is an asterisk on that five year development period. But let's ignore everything I just said and say that the Saturn V took one less year to reach orbit than it took Starship. Does that make Starship slow? Absolutely not. The Saturn V was built for Apollo, a crash program to get someone on the moon as fast as humanly possible. Especially early in the program, they had all but a blank check from the government to get that done. The Saturn V program ended up costing $6.4 billion, just over double what NASA gave Starship, but before you get too excited, that's 1970s money. So it's more like $53.3 billion today, or 18 times what they gave Starship. NASA did give SpaceX another $1.15 billion in 2022, bringing the total to just over $4 billion, but that's still peanuts compared to what they gave the Saturn V. And for all that cost, the Saturn V was way less complex than Starship. Granted, it was built 60 years ago, but it was smaller, lighter, had half the thrust, and was completely expendable. The only part of that rocket that returned to Earth in one piece was the command module, this tiny little cone. And even that part was never reused. Starship is planning on reusing everything. The booster will land like Falcon 9 once they trust it enough, and the Starship will also try to land. This adds so much complexity to Starship over the Saturn V. You have heat shielding, extremely advanced navigation and aerodynamics, longer times in orbit, more engine relights, many more moving parts, and the ability to throttle your engines. Yeah, the Saturn V didn't have throttable engines. The only engine on there that could be throttled was on the lunar lander. So why don't we compare Starship to something that's a little more complex? <music> Understanding all of these complexities and innovations in the aerospace industry can be quite challenging. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is an excellent interactive learning platform whose goal is to make mastering concepts in science, engineering, and math engaging and fun. Whether you're looking to enhance your understanding of physics, dive deep into rocket science, or you're simply looking for a challenge, Brilliant has courses tailored for you. One of the reasons I love Brilliant is their hands-on approach to learning. They have interactive lessons that keep you engaged and help you learn through problem solving and critical thinking. This is perfect for those who are curious and want to understand how the world works at a deeper level. Their How Technology Works course takes you inside the technology you use every day to give you an engineer's understanding. From computer memory, which teaches you about computational logic using hands-on experiments with transistors, to GPS, which covers all of the ways that technology can pinpoint your location on Earth, you can learn all about the technology that allows modern spacecraft to navigate and fly autonomously. Try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days at brilliant.org slash conhappy and get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks again to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. The space shuttle was the first attempt at reusability. It paved the way for the technology that enables SpaceX to make Starship. For example, the heat shield of Starship builds on all the shuttle experience and uses the same base materials. And all the modern avionics and controls are built on the foundations laid by NASA for the shuttle and earlier Apollo missions. In fact, early SpaceX prototypes actually flew on the space shuttle as payloads. Now the shuttle didn't achieve the reusability that it wanted to. But despite its flaws and dangers, it was a massive leap in capability in space and generated a lot of important technologies. So for this discussion, all of that complexity makes it a more fair comparison to Starship. The shuttle was approved in 1972. The first prototype started construction in 1974, did some flight testing in 1977, and finally the first flight to orbit was launched in 1981. So for the whole program, that's nine years. And from the first prototype to orbit is still seven years. This program costs about $10.6 billion just for development from 1972 to 1982. And that's about $60 billion today, a bit more than the Saturn V and still 15 times what Starship has been given so far. So despite having a fraction of the funding, Starship is still moving faster than the shuttle. But maybe that's still a little unfair. The space shuttle paved the way for Starship and created a ton of technologies from scratch while trying to fit way too many requirements from NASA, Congress, and even the Department of Defense. 
Maybe the best comparison has been right in front of us the whole time. Who better to set the benchmark for SpaceX than SpaceX? They built the Falcon 9, the first and currently only reusable orbital rocket. It's the most prolific launcher in the world by such a wide margin it's become a running joke. For reference, last year 80% of the mass put into orbit rode on a Falcon 9, and this year that number looks like it's going to be a lot bigger. But anyway, how long did it take to develop the Falcon 9? Well, SpaceX announced that they would start work on Falcon 9 in late 2005, and it flew for the first time in June of 2010. That's about four and a half years, or about a year and a half shorter than Starship. But this is a much smaller rocket. The entire vehicle, booster, second stage, and fairing is shorter than just the first stage of Starship. And it wasn't reusable in 2010. It didn't even have landing legs or grid fins. It was designed to be expendable first, and they wouldn't even attempt to splash down for another three years. And it didn't successfully splash down until 2014. So that's nine years from the start of the Falcon 9 program to the first splashdown of a booster. Starship did it in six. Now that's also unfair, because in those four extra years, Falcon 9 flew nine operational missions that delivered payloads to orbit, but it highlights the added complexity of trying to land a booster, let alone the second stage. So what's the lesson here? Well, Starship clearly is not slow. It's moving incredibly fast for how massive and complex it is. And it's doing it at a bargain rate as far as NASA is concerned. So no, I don't think that my comments from three years ago aged like milk. Starship, with the funding and knowledge of NASA, has continued to evolve rapidly and has proven that with some more work, it can become a functional and incredibly powerful launch system. And with that rant over, I'm Con Hathi. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. This is going to be a very interesting video to look back at in a few years. You know, Starship, it could flop, it could pivot entirely, or it could be a huge success. We really don't know. But so far, SpaceX has made a lot of ambitious promises, and they've been a pretty safe bet. I mean, they won commercial crew, and then they beat Boeing by years, which surprised a lot of people. And don't forget about Falcon 9 reuse. They landed that booster, and it was a huge achievement, and it's kind of been forgotten by the mainstream. But yeah, I don't think there's a better company out there to be attempting for reuse, and I am very excited to watch this project over the next few years. See you guys next time.